My good man, it's always a pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Hey, thanks for being back here. And let's start off with gold. And just about a week ago, and then a couple days ago, we saw thousands and thousands of contracts that were dumped. I think it was like 10,000 one week, 38,000 the next week. I mean, is is this being done on purpose? Or is this normal where people just dump thousands upon thousands of paper contracts on you know in the gold market is this normal it's 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 difficult to to uh confidently discern from one raid to the next what may have caused it because sometimes you see massive spikes as well um and it's always one of two culprits it either is deliberately done by you know these colluding bank trading desks and again anybody that disputes this uh, I just simply has their head in the sand and is denying reality. Now that we know through the class action suits and the affidavits and the other discovery, legal discovery that's gone on, that this happens, that the banks uh, communicate, the traders communicate through uh, chat rooms and texts, you know, and that kind of thing. And I don't, we don't need to relitigate all of that this morning, but it's there. Everybody knows this. But there are still those out there that say, oh, no, that doesn't happen. <laughs> OK, not sure what color the sky is in their world, but that's fine. Um, that these moves happen to the upside as well. And so sometimes the moves are generated by the bank. Sometimes they're just simply generated by what I would call an algo gone wild. You know, 90% of the volume on the New York Stock Exchange is now HFT computers swapping positions back and forth to each other. And I have not ever seen a number for the amount of volume on the COMEX in gold and silver that can be attributed to high frequency trading. But I'm, I mean, if it's 90% in New York Stock Exchange, it's what, at least half, maybe, on COMEX, probably no more. And so what you'll see sometimes are these massive stop runs uh, that create spikes up and down. Uh, and again, it's hard to discern whether it's an algo gone wild or whether it's just a, a, a cartel suppression move. Recently, we've seen several that I think you can lay at the feet of the banks. And the way we can do that sometimes is to look at other markets to see if other uh, key indicators are moving at the same time. Like, for example, last Friday, uh, there was a big dump of gold futures. It broke price back down through the 100-day moving average and eventually took it by uh, yesterday early back down to the 200-day moving average. You could go, oh, you could look at that quickly and say, well, okay, I can see why uh, agents of the banks would want to accomplish that, right? And then you look and you see, OK, there was nothing else going on at the time. There was not you know, a big spike in interest rates. There was not a big spike in the dollar yen, which are two key drivers of that digital gold price. And so that helps you discern sometimes, again, whether it was a random act by an algo um, or whether it was something deliberately uh, done. Today we saw it again, uh, again, a price smash back down and through that same 100-day moving average that was the target back on Friday. Um, and it sets up a rather interesting situation as we go into the end of the year, Dave. And that is, um, you know, the last two years, as we've gone through November and December, price has fallen uh, rather dramatically in anticipation of a Fed rate hike. Uh, we hit a low. We hit the bear market low back in December of 2015, below 1100 in price. And again, people were calling, you know, oh, we're going to have triple digit gold prices in 2016. Of course, that wasn't the case. We hit another low uh, in December of last year. And again, same voices calling out for triple digit gold prices in 2017. That hasn't been the case. And so now here we are um, expecting another Fed rate hike next month. I'm wondering if perhaps uh, the market in gold and also just the markets in general are beginning to front run this a little bit. Gold finding support here in November rather than being weak. And uh, perhaps maybe uh, we won't get the washout into the rate hike like last time. And uh, so what, it'll be very interesting over the next couple of weeks to watch and see how it plays out. Yeah, it seems like uh, the powers that be, they kind of keep gold and silver, you know, steady. They If it starts moving up a little bit, all of a sudden it's brought back down. And what's very interesting about this is it looks like to me, I mean, I, I've been watching it, you've been watching it for a very long time, that they're trying to keep people out of that market. And, you know, the crypto market has popped up and, you know, money is being uh, put into the crypto market. And I'm wondering 
if you know they were like okay let's keep them out of the precious metals market hopefully they'll take that money and put it into the stock market or or they'll spend it someplace else or invest it someplace else and you know a lot of people are looking at the crypto market saying you know what i'll place my funds there because the crypto market is going up right now i'm not saying that crypto is you know, the alternative for everything but i'm just saying it looks like they've been trying to keep people out of this market and try to keep people away from you know what the economy is really doing what the dollar is really doing what inf what you know the inflation that's really happening that's what i've been seeing are, are, are you getting the same sense or are you getting something different well you know getting back to uh holding gold in a certain level there's a couple things going on there i mean remember we found out when uh, wikileaks published those cables from 1973 and 1974 and 1975 i mean there are official documents here stating that the intention of creating the paper futures markets on the comex in 1974 remember they began december or january 1st 1975 or actually december 31 1974 the intention was to drive people out of a physical gold ownership deflect uh, gold demand into these uh, derivative contracts, thereby doing like alchemy, really, but also to get people to not want to be in gold. And so that is part of it. I mean, if they can hold price in check, uh, dispirit folks, uh, get them to be more interested in other asset classes, as you said, that's all uh, part of the puzzle, no doubt about it. Um, as you look at it at present, though, I I was I really, I think, uh, the first, if not one of the first, to discover uh, almost accidentally a little over three years ago, the clear link between uh, COMEX digital gold prices and the dollar yen. And if you go back uh, and, 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 and really look at a lengthy market history, you can see the two were not correlated at all, the yen and gold, until about 2008. Well, gosh, Dave, what happened in 2008? Uh, the whole financial global market structure collapsed and been kind of pieced and held, pieced together and held together in the nine or 10 years since. And really beginning in about 2008, suddenly the price of gold began to move almost in lockstep with the dollar yen. The dollar yen, as it's presented and quoted all the time, if it goes up, the price of gold goes down. So if you want to see them together on a chart, you have to invert the dollar yen, make it the yen dollar. Then you plot them together and you see them move almost tick for tick. Now, like I said, we discovered that three and a half years ago, and it it makes forecasting the metals a little bit easier and you know, in that – if you could just simply predict where the dollar yen is going, you got a pretty good idea where gold is going, right? And it's a very great limiting force for the price because if if gold is going to be priced based off the dollar yen and if the dollar yen is range bound, then therefore the price of gold is going to be range bound too. I think probably most interesting in all of this is not that that, uh, that relationship now is there because it clearly is. It's in trying to discern why. It's there. And, and I, I can't take credit for this. I, I got an email uh, on this probably six months ago now uh, from a friend of mine, uh, actually two guys in London, Ned Naylor Leyland and then uh, Paul Milcrest, who are probably names that most everybody knows. And they had been discussing this and they sent this over to me to see what I thought. And I thought, you know, this makes a lot of sense. Um, we all recognize that all of us that follow uh, the metals, that the price is set and discovered, if you will, in these uh, derivative markets, and that the bullion banks and their trading desks, they are the uh, active managers, the market makers, if you will, of those markets. They're the ones that create the contracts. They're the ones that feed the contracts to the specs to try to restrain price and all that kind of stuff. It used to be back in the day in the creation of any futures market, it was designed as a way for uh, producers to hedge and forward sell their uh, production, right? I mean, that's the idea behind the uh, board of trade, whatever. You know, it was this outlet for the producers to sell and the speculators taking the other side of these trades. Well, the producers don't really hedge anymore. I mean, the hedge books of the gold producers got to nearly zero back in 2014 and 15. And some of the most recent numbers I've seen peg the total amount of gold forward sold and hedged in the world to be somewhere around 8 million ounces. Well, 8 million ounces, Dave, is about 80,000 COMEX contracts if, if all of that hedging was done on the COMEX. But then, you know, you look at the CFTC numbers and the banks report a short positions near 200,000 contracts. OK, so 
what's really going on here. The banks are clearly uh, speculating and they are now the ones responsible for the short positions. The banks, the, the producers aren't hedging. So the banks are taking that short side of the trade on themselves in, in large part naked, just simply taking the financial risk, knowing that they've got deep pockets and they can outlast the specs. So if the banks are taking that massive risk, you know, they, they like to lay off that risk. They like to hedge that risk. They, I guess the proper technical term is delta hedging. Okay, so if you've got this massive risk of being short paper gold and you'd like to hedge it, how are you going to hedge that exclusively in gold itself? I mean, it's just, it's not a very deep pool to be able to do that and to be able to cover your footprints. And so what Ned and Paul suggested was that the banks themselves devised these algorithms that link on a day by day, hour by hour, really tick by tick basis, the price of digital gold around the world with the dollar yen. Therefore, because if you could then turn gold into the yen, basically by linking the two prices together, then you can delta hedge your risk of being short gold in the way deeper pool of yen. I mean, Forex is what, six, seven trillion dollars a day in trading volume? Dollar yen is probably at least a tenth of that. So we're talking 600, 700 billion dollars a day in trading volume. And that's why it's been done. So again, putting all this back together is a very lengthy answer to, <laughs> I'm not even sure this was your question, but a price being held in check, it's held in check because it's been tied to the yen and it's been tied to the yen by the banks so that they can manage their risk of being short and uh, and thus keep the price in check. Does that all make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it sounds like one gigantic manipulation scheme where they're protecting themselves. That's pretty much what they're doing. Right. And so what we have to hope for uh, eventually is a crack in that manipulation scheme, which is a, essentially a confidence scheme. Because the banks manage that price and manage their risk and all that other stuff. But then they also ultimately do have responsibility of delivering physical metal into that price. You know, the World Gold Council can go on and on about how gold demand is down because they count all of this alchemy, all of this digital and paper metal that's out there that's not the real thing. I mean, it was a hilarious report. They put it out last week. They said gold demand is down. Oh, but physical demand for bars and coins is up 17%. But gold demand is down. What? I mean, did, did it even dawn on them th th how that doesn't make any sense? And so what we have to hope for eventually is that this confidence scheme, this just-in-time delivery, this, oh, yeah, no, your gold's fine. No, accept this, this obligation for gold. Oh, no, no, this is pretend gold. But no, really, it's gold. It's going to move like it's gold, but it's, it gives you gold exposure. We get to the point where that confidence scheme fails, where – uh, Ray Dalio, who says he's buying, you know, however many billion dollars worth of gold, but he buys it all in the GLD where Ray Dalio says, you know, what, I, you know, I'm not playing this game anymore. I want the real thing. That's when the banks finally have a real problem and this whole scheme collapses. Dave, I'll give you one more thing just because it's fresh in my mind. I was, I was just writing a post uh, this morning on Thursday before we spoke. And it was updating some numbers, and it's something I, I like to put out there every once in a while, and it was just on my mind this morning. Um, the paper derivative pricing scheme that we call it is such a scam. Um, and, and in the metals, it's particularly egregious, right? Um, in gold, total gold mine supply on an annual basis is something like 2,800 metric tons. But if you look at the total COMEX gold open interest, uh, it's about maybe 58, 59% of global mine supply. Okay. That's so of all the contracts that are currently trading 530,000 or something, right? That's 53 million ounces. Again, that's about, let's just call it 60% of global mine supply. That same ratio is the case in platinum as well. If you drop down to copper, the total amount of COMEX open interest in copper is less than 20% of global mine supply. So right then you got to be scratching your head. Well, how the hell does this work? Let me throw one more at you. Total COMEX open interest of silver, 125% of global mine supply. <laughs> wow. If, any, if anything, it's a measure of the extent and the, and the, the depths to which the bankers have gone 
to uh, keep this scheme afloat. Yeah, 125% of global mine supply for silver, 20% of global mine supply for copper. And so thus, at the end of the day, people often ask me, they say, what do you think of the gold-silver ratio? Is 75 to 1, and historically, going back to Roman times, it's 15 to 1. And I think, yeah, what? I, I don't care. You know what the, you know the gold-silver ratio is telling you and why it's distorted that much? That's telling you the supply of not physical gold and silver. It's the supply of digital gold and silver. That's why that ratio is at 75 to 1, because there's maybe you look at it, you say there's five times as many silver derivatives and, and uh, you know, digital forms of it, then there are gold. That's why that price is so out of whack. Uh, boy, I tell you, Dave, when this fall eventually fails, and obviously we've been waiting for it now for years, and people think, oh, this guy just talks about the same shit every single time. Um, but it will fail. I have no doubt about it. And, man, is it going to be spectacular when it does? Yeah, these things always fail. I mean, it might take a long time because they're able to, to manipulate for a very long time. But eventually what happens is things start to break down. People lose confidence, like you said, and people ask for you know physical and they start to realize that there's something wrong with the economy. And I, I just wanted to talk about the economy for a sec here. I mean, um, the unemployment numbers, they came out and we've been dropping the unemployment rate for quite a while. It's been, you know, dropping since I think like 2012, 13, and we're down to 4.1% now. I mean, when you look at these numbers, is this telling you that everything is fine and everyone's getting a job and we're at full employment? Or is it telling you that there's something else going on here? No, that's a scam of the first order. Uh, the only reason the unemployment rate, as they stated, has fallen and it fell again this month is because the amount of people not in the labor force, not in the denominator of that rate shrunk and it continues to shrink. It shrunk by 900,000 people in October. And so if you have the same amount of people, let's call it working, but the amount of people in your labor force gets smaller, then that unemployment rate gets better. And that's what happens. And it's a statistical scam by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, because if if you're not, uh, if you don't have a job for 12 months, then they just consider you to be out of the labor force. So these people that are structurally unemployed, either they're on disability, they're on opiates, they just simply can't find a freaking job, right? They're just considered right. to be oh, not in the labor force anymore. Isn't that convenient? And therefore, we can print this number of 4.1% and, and create the illusion that everything's great. Because if you can create the illusion that everything's great, then the banks remain in charge. And, and, uh, and, and CNBC and Bloomberg can talk about how wonderful things are. And the stock market continues to go up. And the wealth disparity continues to increase. And the income disparity continues to increase. And it's all done for the benefit of those that are in charge. Meanwhile... The average everyday regular people, the ones that do all the living, breathing and dying in this country are working two or three part time jobs, trying to keep their heads above water, trying to feed their families, get them to school, somehow figure out if there's any way they can go to college because by running up the cost of college costs, they've shoveled a trillion dollars of debt onto the students backs because they got to find new debt from somebody. It's all a massive scam, all designed to enrich and empower the financial political elite in this country it works until it doesn't but i yeah, think that, anybody that falls for it still at this point is you know that's their own fault and not doing the homework to understand how this country really works i mean if these unemployment numbers were really you know true i mean we would see retail because if everyone has a job right now and they're saying everyone has this is a full-time job number and everyone's working we wouldn't see retail imploding on itself and i know people say well everything's moving to online well online sales right now is only 10 percent of a trillion dollar retail market and we're not seeing everything move to online i mean the brick and mortar businesses they're still there and every time one shuts down it's not like oh all those sales go right to online you see the one-to-one -one ratio and everything's fine so if unemployment is continually dropping wouldn't you think the retail numbers would be a lot better and we would see more stores not closing down we would see an expansion of retail well th that's definitely true and you could also look at that and say you know people desperately trying to save 
at this point too, right? Because they're all in debt and they're recognizing as you're getting older, you got to try to save more. So maybe they're spending less. I would look at it on the flip side of that though, Dave. I mean, if, if, if it were true, if it were true that uh, employment supply was tight, that's what uh, essentially that unemployment rate is trying to tell you is that demand for workers is high and supply of workers is tight. Thus, the unemployment rate is amazingly 4.1%. If that was the case, how do you attract new workers? How do you get them to take your job versus another job in town? Because you're desperately searching out new workers. You know, you're trying to to get, meet your demand for new workers. Well, you got to give them a raise, right? You got to say, okay, I'll pay you $17 an hour versus 15, right? That's How do you true. retain yes. people from going from your company to somebody else? I'll give you a raise, Bob. I don't want you to leave. I'll match that up. It would, if it, if the employment situation in the U S really was tied at 4.1%, then you would see wages, wages rising and the middle income families beginning to prosper at least from having higher rate wage. And the absolute opposite is true. We're seeing just today, real average hourly earnings now have declined three months in a row, and they've fallen dramatically since the beginning of 2015 and moving toward recession levels. So again, if anything underlies the absolute fraud and sham of this number that supposedly shows how robust the U.S. economy is, look at the unemployment rate, it's that. There's no earnings growth. Nobody has any money to spend, and their cost of living continues to go up through, through health care costs. It's scam of Obamacare, what was shoved down your throat. My premiums have quadrupled in eight years. you got uh, a, a cost for education. You've got... Cost for fuel, food, rent, everything else going through the roof, taxes going through the roof, and stagnant wages. How does that in in any way lead to a prosperous country? But no, that's not what CNBS tells you. That's not what J.P. Morgan, great analyst, comes on and tells you how wonderful things are. It's man, I, I find it extraordinarily frustrating to watch. And again, all you can do, anyone can do is educate themselves so that you're not caught flat-footed when this entire house of cards finally collapses. Yeah, what you're saying is absolutely true because if you go back to like 95 to 2007, you saw the unemployment rate very low and wages were continually moving up during that period of time. And it was very difficult, especially in the tech area. It was very difficult to find certain individuals to work and they were, you know, raising the salaries every single time. Now we see the opposite happening where everything is heading the in the opposite direction. So you can tell that something is completely off. And you're right. I mean, this whole thing is one gigantic illusion. Now, the Fed, they are out there and, you know, in the beginning of the year, they, you know, they increased the Fed rate and they said they were going to do it a lot more times during this year, but they haven't as of yet. Why don't you think the Fed actually raised the rates once again? I mean, they did it twice in the beginning of the year. Why didn't they continue on this track? Well, they kind of took a quarter off, it seems. Um, if they do hike again in December... That'll be the third one this year. It'll be whatever that is, the fifth one. Maybe that's the sixth one since they started uh, two years ago. The problem is they the only a rate that they can uh, directly control is that Fed funds rate, the shortest of the short rates, the overnight rate. That's the rate that they everybody thinks they will, will raise again in a couple of weeks. That's at the short end of the curve. The problem is the Fed, the Bank of Japan, the ECB, Bank of England, Swiss National Bank, they've all created something like $14 trillion worth of currency, if you convert it all to dollars, over the last nine years in an attempt to reflate, pump up their banks, everything else. Well, that $14 trillion is looking for a home, Dave. I mean, because there's so much cash sloshing around the planet, you get a 10-year note yield from Portugal and from Spain and from Italy that are lower than the yields here in the U.S. I mean, it's just insanity. And so all this cash is slosh around the planet, desperately looking for some level of return. It, it makes a constant bid in the global bond markets. That means interest rates on the longer end of the curve continue to stay low. They're actually down year to date. And so the Fed is increasing rates at the short end. So think of that end of the teeter-totter going up. While the market is forcing interest rates lower on the long end, that end of the teeter-totter going down, eventually you get a flat teeter-totter. Well, a flat yield curve from any classical economic sense is a precursor of a recession. 
Um, I invite anybody go to type in Fred graphs or Fred charts into Google. It'll take you to the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis uh, educational site. You can make any kind of chart you want there based off of historical data. You look at the yield curve and you plot it over the last 40 years. Anytime the spread between two years and 10 years or five years and 30 years, anytime it goes negative, a recession follows within six to 12 months. It's happened five times in the last 40 years, and it has happened every single time. Well, guess what? That's where we're headed now. In fact, yesterday, one of the goons on the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, this guy named Boston, actually came out and said, oh, you know what? I don't buy any of that. I really don't think uh, a flat yield curve leads to recession. I'm thinking, what? Bostic, do you not know any history? Do you, have you never even learned economics? What the hell are you doing on the Fed Board of Governors? It happens every time. And that's where we're headed. And that's why, to get to answer your question, why would the Fed be dragging their feet a little bit? Because that's where we're headed. That's what they're trying to get the long end up. That's what this idea of trimming $10 billion a month off their balance sheet is trying to do. They're trying to sell some long end bonds to try to force rates higher. But as soon as they put some out there, they're quickly gobbled up by the ECB and the Bank of Japan and, and all these other uh, central banks and institutions around the globe that are desperately searching for yield. So as they raise the short end, the long end falls, the yield curve flattens. That's a precursor of recession. We will be talking about it. We should be talking about it now, but we'll definitely be talking about it by this time next year, by summer next year. Then what's the Fed going to do? Oh, they're going to cut. <laughs> They'll be looking at QE again. Oh, my goodness gracious. What a mess. Uh, and all the while at the same time. Um, we sit here and, and watch gold go sideways. It is a rather remarkable time to be alive. Um, I, I sense next year will be a wildly unpredictable year. Said that about this year, it certainly turned out that way. Uh, next year will be even more so, and it'll be uh, interesting to see how it plays out. So do you think the Fed or the ECB or the IMF, I mean, the IMF came out and buried in their paper, they said, you know, we're heading towards this economic crisis uh, global economic crisis. They, they know what's happening. They understand what's happening, even though they tell us, oh, you know, the, you know, the yield curve and there's no bubbles. I mean, this is all stuff to make you completely look the other way, um, just like they did in uh, prior to 2008 recession. Do you think the central banks right now, you think they're, they're back into a corner and they really have no way out of this situation that they created? Yeah. You know, if you go back, I remember in 2009, March of 2009, uh, we were still in the throes of the financial crisis at that point. There are a lot of questions which way things are going. And it was then that the Ben Bernanke first announced QE, you know, and it was going to be whatever it was, $600 billion, you know, of uh, essentially debt monetization by the Fed, direct monetization to pump cash and buy bonds off of the bank's balance sheet, you know, and try to infuse cash back into them and all that kind of stuff. And there was a lot of talk back then that once you start down this path, you, you can't get off it. I mean, it's um, it's like becoming a heroin addict, you know? You, you shoot up once, that's pretty much all it takes. You know, you, you just want more and more of it as you go, and pretty soon you're a junkie, and then after that, you're dead. And that's what the central banks, that's where the central banks took us beginning in 2009. And so they can't stop now. Uh, they won't be able to stop now. The 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 monster they've created requires a continual feeding of fresh fiat. And so, eh, you know, for now, well, the Fed isn't doing any uh, direct overt QE at this point. Well, maybe you could say that. It's just not their turn. Have you seen what the Bank of Japan's doing? See what the ECB continues to do? See how the, the Swiss National Bank continues to, the Swiss, for God's sake, Dave, Historically, for centuries, considered the most economically conservative people on the planet, the Swiss are printing French francs from nothing because they pegged it to the euro and they have to. And they're taking their freshly minted francs and they're buying Apple. <laughs> what? Yeah, they're <laughs> buying is, the tech stocks. Yeah, this is madness. This is absolute madness. But it, they can't stop because if they stop, the whole thing just whoosh, melts away. So again, it uh, it augurs for continued craziness. Uh, I think a lot of folks, and, and really, I couldn't blame most people for the at this point for saying, "Well, hell, it's just going to go on forever." I mean, if they can print nonstop, then it's just going to, you know, why will they ever let things collapse? Well, it, it, at some point, it just simply becomes about the math. 
You know, the, uh, for example, the U.S. federal deficit and debt, you know, it's stated at almost $21 trillion at this point. And it's taking because they've, they've forced everything, all the borrowing into the shortest part of the yield curve where all the rates are low. It's taken about $400 billion a year to service that debt. Well, you know, anybody knows a rule of 72, you know, if, if it grows at 9% a year, it's going to double in eight years, which is about what happened under Obama, right? So if it doubles again another eight years, we're talking $40 trillion in U.S. debt. And in provided interest rates don't move, now we're talking nearly a, a, a you know a trillion dollars a year in interest payment. Well, where's that cash going to come from? Through the continual printing and devaluation of the currency. If you can't get demand for the debt from the consumer, then the banks just simply have to print it to service it all. And that's where this, this merry-go-round never stops. It only spins faster. And it becomes exponential and parabolic. Hey, is it exponential and parabolic now? Yeah, you could say that, but... Hell's bells, Dave, at 40 trillion, at 80 trillion, it's really exponential and parabolic. And some, at some point, you just simply can't devalue and print fast enough to keep the plate spinning. And um, at that point, I think anybody that, that even if you bought gold and silver in 2011 and you're sitting there wringing your hands because it's down 30% or your silver's down 60%, it ain't going to be down 30 and 60% at that point. So you just hang on and, uh, and just be glad you'll have it. Craig, thank you very much for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Once again, how can people see your work? It's pretty simple. Uh, TF Metals Report is a site that's populated by <laughs> a lot of people that think the way I do. And uh, we're all in it together. We all support each other. Uh, we're troll free, which is great because it's a whopping 12 bucks a month to be a part of it. And it's amazing, Dave, how 40 cents a day eliminates all the trolls. Uh, it's great. And, and, and it's not that we don't want, you know, trolls for argument's sake. It's just that it's just such a distraction for people that come and they're just bitter and angry and, and argumentative. We're here to help each other. We're here because we know where this is headed. And on the site, we talk about metals on a daily basis, economy, all the stuff you and I have talked about. And again, it's a whopping 12 bucks a month to be a part of it. TFMetalsReport.com. Craig, once again, thank you very much. 